Revelation 5, verse 11. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down in worship. We might just be starting our song this morning. There's one that's already going on. And we want to join in with that song as we sing the praises of the Lamb who was slain. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to another Daily Devotion, number 65. Welcome to another week of Daily Devotions. I hope you had a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed uh, your church on Sunday, that you enjoyed going and meeting with the people of God. Well, we're returning once again to the book of Second Peter. We're going to be back in chapter 1. If this is your first time with us, a very warm welcome to you. And I encourage you to open up the Bible with me this morning or this afternoon. I have a habit of getting that wrong all the time this afternoon and dig into the word together. So if you've got your Bibles there, we're going to be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for another week that we can be back into our daily devotions again. We ask that you would use the words written by Peter here, which come from your mouth, to feed us In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, at the time of the Reformation, one of the the accusations that was laid against the Reformers was that their teaching, their doctrine, would lead to godlessness, to unholy living. It would lead to ineffectiveness. So the, the Catholics accused the Protestants, the Reformers, saying that, If they teach that people are saved by grace alone, that the gospel will save by grace alone, no works required, people aren't going to do any works. Now, of course, the problem with that, obviously, is that it's not biblical. The problem with that is that it denies the clear teaching of Peter right here. And you see, the the teaching of Peter here leads directly on, funnily enough, 
from the last two verses we looked at, verse 3 and 4, where if you remember at the end of last week, I know it's a, it's a long time ago, but back at verse 3 and 4, we saw that we had received this great gift that God had granted us many things and that he had granted us his divine power and knowledge and a calling to excellence and glory and promises and partaking in divine nature, and being escape, escaping from the world, and all, all this stuff. And it was just amazing, this huge picture of the stuff that God was giving us through his kindness and love and mercy. And now, I said to you last week that after that, Peter would lead into what we have to do. And that's what he does just here. You see, the gospel, contrary to what the Catholics said to the Reformers, the gospel doesn't lead to ineffectiveness. The true gospel of Christ does not lead to ineffectiveness, does not lead to godlessness, does not lead to unfruitfulness, but, but rather the complete opposite. It leads to fruitfulness. It leads to profit. It leads to effectiveness. It leads to godliness and holiness. And so Peter, having laid that foundation in verse 3 and 4, now goes on to exhort his hearers, his readers, to do what they've been called to do, to be who they've called to be. And so in verse 5, he says, for this very reason. So for the reason that you have been grounded and founded in the goodness of God and all that he's given you. Because you have a solid foundation in the gospel, make every effort to supplement. Strive with all your might. Exert great force to, to supplement your faith. Now notice he doesn't say create faith because faith is the foundation. Faith is the starting point. We are saved by faith alone. So we, we put our faith in Christ and having believed... Having faith, having been saved by grace, we supplement our faith with virtue. And virtue, dot, dot, dot. So virtue speaks of a moral excellence. It's the same word that's used back in verse 3 for excellence. You remember he said he called him who called us to his own glory and excellence, meaning firstly that we're getting called into his glory and excellence, but also, and probably more so, that we're being called to exhibit the same glory and excellence. So we're, we're to add to our faith, not, not just sit on the laurels of our faith and do nothing, but we're to add to our faith, supplement to our faith, moral excellence. Perfect as he would say in First Peter, be perfect as your father is perfect. So we add virtue and, and virtue with knowledge. And it's all of these interestingly connect together. You see, in order to have moral excellence, what do you need to know? Well, you need to know what's the excellent way and how are you going to know the excellent way? By studying the scriptures, by adding knowledge. It's a it's an intellectual reality. It's not a looking up into the sky and hoping we know what is the best course of action. It's picking up the word of God, looking at the life of Christ, looking at the teaching of the apostles and asking, what does moral excellence look like? What does it look like to live like Christ? Because Christ, of course, is the most moral, excellent character, isn't he? He's perfect. He never made a mistake. So if you want moral excellence, you look to Christ and you say, there's Christ. That's what he looks like. That's what I have to be like because I've been called to be like him. And so we put on virtue with knowledge because we need that knowledge to put on the virtue and knowledge with self-control. Makes a lot of sense, don't we? we? We, With our knowledge, we begin to understand what is right and what is wrong. And we see evil. We see wickedness. We see lust. We see uh, alcoholics. We see all the different sin in the world. Greed, pride, whatever it is. And we look at it and we put self-control on. And we go, no, I'm not going to go near those things. I'm going to hold them at bay. And in order to be morally excellent, we have to hold sin at bay, don't we? But in order to be morally excellent, adding that to our faith, we also need to be steadfast. So he says, and self-control with steadfastness. We need to endure. This is not a short journey, is it? 
This is not like a, you know, you come to the faith and one charge, one blast and done. No, it's a repetitive, ongoing, hardworking, enduring process where bit by bit by bit, we slowly and surely by the power of the Holy Spirit become more virtuous, become more like Christ, which is what true virtue really is. And we have to endure. And having endured, we add to our endurance godliness because as as we begin to put off sin and as we begin to steadfastly pursue the teaching of Christ and add virtue, we become more like God. And so we're putting on godly living. And putting on godly living, we add brotherly affection and love. And so not only are we working on the internal heart, not only are we working on the self and the, and the way we live with our outward actions, but we're also putting on how we live with one another. And so we strive to add to our faith a love for the brothers and sisters in Christ and a love in general towards people in the world, which is something we sorely need to be reminded of today, don't we, with all the bizarre things going on in the world, that we would love people of all different times with the love of Christ, with a love which is virtuous. But, but notice that he doesn't just tell us what we have to do, but he tells, tells us why we should make sure we're doing them. Have a look at verse 8. He says, If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we don't put these things on, if we just sit back and say, oh, I've got faith, I'm just going to rest in my faith. We will prove what the Catholics said to be true. We will be ineffective and fruitless and, and achieve nothing. In fact, James says, if you can remember back to when we were in the book of James, James says that that type of a faith is not a real faith anyway. It's a dead faith. The faith that says, well, it doesn't matter what I do. I can just sit around and do nothing is a dead faith. And so an alive faith is one that is fruitful. And putting on these things will ensure you're fruitful and therefore protect you against that dead type of faith. But not only that, the second reason he gives is that, have a look at verse 9, whoever lacks these qualities, so if you don't have these qualities, you're saying you have faith, but you're not supplementing your faith with these qualities more and more. It shows that you lack these qualities, sorry, for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So in other words, if you don't look back at the sins that you've been forgiven by, and if you forget that you've been cleansed from your sins, and you go, ah, well, it doesn't really matter how I live, I can just live how I want, you're blind and nearsighted, because you don't see the fact that the faith that you've put in Christ must lead to a changed life. And, and you run the risk of making a train wreck of, of your faith. You run the risk of making a train wreck of your faith because the, f- the fruit you produce, the effectiveness you produce, produce is the evidence that you are saved. Have a, have a look at verse 10 and 11. That's his point. He says, therefore, so he says, supplement all, all of your faith, supplement it with all these things so you grow to be more like Christ because otherwise you're going to be ineffective because otherwise it shows you're spiritually blind and immature. Therefore, show your salvation or confirm your salvation. By doing it. Have a look at verse 10 to 11. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be the more diligent. Be, don't, don't, don't be unintentional. Be diligent. Be super intentional. Be super intentional to confirm your calling and election. Now just pause there. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Often one of the arguments against doctrines like election and predestination and the perseverance of the saints one of the common arguments is, well, if you tell people they're elect and guaranteed salvation, then they'll be ineffective. They'll do nothing. Well, Peter argues from the complete opposite direction, and he says, actually, if you're an elect child of God, and if you've been called out by God, then 
be diligent to prove that to be true. That's what he means by confirm. Prove it to be true. Like James says, I'll prove my faith by my works. You show me your faith without your works, because I know it's not true, and I'll show you my faith with my works. So, if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And he loops back to the beginning, back to the foundation again. So he says, in the beginning he says, this is your foundation, everything you've been granted by God. Therefore, you know, add virtues to it. Why? Because that way you're going to be effective. Therefore, prove your salvation by putting on virtues, by living the way that you should live if you're an elect child of God, because in doing that, you're going to give yourself assurance. You're going to show in yourself, in your action, in your life, that there is a kingdom that you're going to. Why? Well, if you live like the world, what are you showing? You're showing that you love the world. But if you live for Christ, and if you live like Christ, you're showing that you love Christ, aren't you? You're showing that you love Christ and you love his kingdom, and that you're longing for a better place. It's a little bit like the way the writer to the Hebrews talks about the men and women in the Hall of Faith, and he says that they, were, they, they looked forward, they didn't receive their promise in this life, but they looked forward longing for a better land to come, because they knew they were not citizens here, but citizens of a far better country. And so we too, longing for a far better country, being called out from this world, begin to put on these qualities. And in putting on these qualities, we give, quali we give assurance to ourselves, a qualifiable assurance to ourselves, that we are of Christ. It's not that these things earn us a place in the kingdom, but they show the fact that we have a place in the kingdom of God. And so the challenge for you and I is, how are you doing? How are we doing on this list? Just take the list of virtue. It, would you describe your life as morally excellent? Well, I don't think any of us could say it is completely morally excellent. But since it's not, what areas in your life are not morally excellent? That's sometimes a better way of thinking about it. You know, consider what you watch on TV. Consider what books you read. Consider the way you speak to people. Consider the way you spend your spare time. Consider the way you treat your husband or wife and act in relationships in the church. Where, where am I lacking moral excellence? And then come to God, repent, and say, God, I failed in this area. Can you help me to live like Christ, to put on, to add virtue to the faith that I have? And then having done that, see where you're lacking in knowledge. And that's this whole reality of interacting with everything. And work through these and, and see where you're struggling. And be honest with God. And be honest with a friend. Talk to your husband or wife or talk to a good friend and say, hey, where am I not doing well in this? Can you help me to see my blind spots? Help me to grow. I want to become more like Christ. And can you hold me accountable? That would be really great. Well, it's been a really... Wonderful reading again to have together, and so let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. We pray that you would watch over us and keep us safe and secure in your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you and keep you, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week for, well, well not next week, tomorrow. I'm thinking like it's Sunday. Tomorrow for another, another devotion. God's richest blessings to you. Have a great day.